Please turn your Bibles to the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5. We'll read from verses 25. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. We'll read these verses. Uh, let me read them and you can follow along. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and an now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to your feet. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday you have uh, given us, Lord, that we may once again be in your courts. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you for your goodness in our lives. Father, this morning, as we sit under the hearing of your word, we pray that you would open up the word to us. We acknowledge we are dull in hearing unless your spirit operates on us and unless your spirit illuminates the word to us, we derive no spiritual profit. So we beg thee, we beg by thy spirit to be in our midst, to open the word, to break the word, to teach us eternal realities, to teach us of the life to come, to prepare us for the life to come. Oh God, please have mercy. Lord, I pray that uh, if any this morning is here who do not understand the spiritual realities, the resurrection, I pray that they, you would open their minds and hearts for those of us who have understood this in part. We pray that you would deepen our understanding that you would write these truths on our heart, that we may live in light of the truths we hear this morning. Holy Spirit, God, this morning, we ask for your blessing as we meditate your word. We commit ourselves to you. We ask you for help. Oh, Lord, unless you speak, our time has been vain. Oh, God, we pray you speak. We pray you speak. We pray these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. It is a reminder of a historical event. We live in a very skeptic age. There is a disregard for history. So one of the things I, I always try to do is we always have to remember resurrection is a historical event. Many of us have come from a society which believes in a lot of myth. We believe in a lot of myth. Resurrection is not a myth. It is a historical, factual event. It has significance. It is the central event, if you will, to Christianity. Resurrection, literally, of the body, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus, literally, physically, happened. You read Luke's gospel, there was no body there. There was an empty tomb. It happened. Someone might ask, Brother Gautam, this happened 2,000 years ago. How, how can we be so sure that it actually happened? What, what, what assurance do you have? 
brothers, many times, or dear ones, many times, we take many things for granted. If I were to tell you Abraham Lincoln existed, you would believe me. Why would you believe me? You would believe me because there are historical records. You never saw him physically, but you would believe that a per certain person, Lincoln, existed. There are biographies of him written. Similarly, we have historical records, and these are preserved for us. The Gospels, the New Testament, the letters, are historical documents. Yes, they are part of Scripture. Yes, they are inspired by God, but they are also historical records. The resurrection happened. Some of these historical records are provided to us not by believers. They were skeptics. Take a man like the Apostle Paul. He was a persecutor of the Christian religion. He wanted to remove Christianity out. Take a man like Luke. Luke in no ways was connected to, to Palestine. He grew up far away from Palestine. He was what we may call a polytheist. He was worshipping. He thought that there are these gods that existed. Each god is in charge of each area. And he, he was a polytheist. And he would bow before those gods. He was an educated man. He was a doctor. He heard of this story. Paul, the apostle Paul, came to that region. He was sharing the gospel. He was sharing the story that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose on the third day. He heard that message. He was from a different religion. He examined the facts. He did an investigation. He recorded for us a gospel called the Gospel of Luke. And in that gospel, he says, these things happen. Resurrection happened. Paul, the persecutor of the Christian religion, says, the resurrected Lord appeared to me. He records six instances in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, these are all the events that happened. The risen Lord appeared to six different times. Last of all, he appeared to me also. Luke and Paul are skeptics, but they observed the facts. They said, this actually happened. And they recorded for us in this book. So this event actually happened, dear ones. This morning, when we approach the resurrection, let's not come here with a mindset of mythology. It is factual. It is real. And it has a meaning to us. Why is the resurrection very important? The world crucified the Lord, saying he is a blasphemer. They said, this man claims to be the son of God. He is committing blasphemy. He is making himself equal with God. The punishment according to our law is, he has to be put to death. You are a liar. You need to be put to death, the world said. In the resurrection, God is raising the son of God to life and saying, he is who he claimed to be. He is in, indeed the second person of the Godhead. He is the son of God. In the resurrection, God is validating the work that Christ came to do. On the cross, the Lord Jesus said, it is finished. Why? What, what is finished? The work of redeeming sinners. I have laid down my life, I have shed my blood, I have paid the ransom. All the work that you gave to me, Father, to make it possible for sinners to approach God, I have completed. My sacrifice is perfect. It is finished, the Lord said. The Lord God, the Father, by raising him up from the dead, is validating that statement. It is finished. Salvation's door is now open. The new and living way is open. 
sinners can commune with God as Father. Their sins are forgiven. They can commune with God the Creator as Father. Resurrection is not only historical, but it is a validation of who Christ claimed to be. It's also a validation of his work that the new and the living way for sinners to approach God has been opened. This morning, we are talking about one resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord. Our, resurrection, the, our Lord, when he was in this world, he, he touched on two other resurrections. And this morning, what I want to do is put before you in his teaching the two other resurrections that he spoke about. The two other resurrections are found in, in the gospel according to St. John, chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. We have read the verses. In these verses, the Lord makes three claims. Three claims in verse 25. This is what the Lord says. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. They will live. In other words, he's talking about a spiritual resurrection. He's saying dead people hear the voice of God. They'll come to life. Verse 26, just as the Son of Man, just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. What the Lord is saying is here, I am the author of life. I have authority to give life. Dead people, when they encounter my voice, they will be raised to life. I am the author of life. He said, the Lord Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. Right? What happened to Lazarus? Raised to life. The Lord had authority. The Lord is saying, I have life. I have authority to give life. So that's the first claim that he makes in verses 25 and 26. The second claim he makes is in verse 27. He says, the father gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Not only is he the author of life, but he's saying he is the judge. He is the judge, all judgment. The son is given authority. The reason he's given authority is because he is the son of man. So what, what is the Lord saying? This is what the Lord is saying. I have received this authority for this reason. I was in the father's glory. I was in his bosom. The father gave me a mission. The Father sent me into this world. The Father told me to take upon yourself flesh and blood. Come in the appearance of a man. Take the form of a servant. The Father gave this mission that he should go to the cross. He should lay down his life. He should experience capital punishment. He should make atonement for sinners. The Father gave this, this mission. The Lord is saying, I have obeyed it. I have finished the work on the cross. I have paid for God, the, the, the sins of God's people. Because I have been obedient to the point of death on the cross, God the Father exalts me and he gives me a name which is above every name. That is what we read in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. The book of Philippians, 
chapter 2, that is what we read. Because the son obeyed the will of the father, even to the point of death on the cross. Therefore, I'm going to read for us verses 9 onwards. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and of those who are in heaven, on earth, under the earth, so that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Because the Son left his glory, fully obeyed the Father, finished the work on the cross for the atonement of sinners, God is rewarding him. God is lifting him up to a position. God is giving him sovereignty. God is giving all rule. And as part of this sovereignty and rule, as, as part of this high name he's given, one of, the obli one, of the, one of the responsibilities would be to execute judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ here is saying, I'm not only the author of life, but I have been given authority to be the judge of all the earth. That's what the Lord is saying. Because he is the son of man, he's been given authority to execute judgment. Okay, third thing, what the Lord is saying in verses 28 and 29. This is what he's saying. The third thing the Lord claims is, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear the voice, will hear his voice. They will come forth, those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. In other words, what the Lord is saying is there's going to come a day. I'm going to come back. There's going to be the voice of the archangel. There's going to be the trumpet of God. There is going to be a day of universal resurrection. The dead will be raised. I, the Lord of the resurrection, would determine the destinies of each and every individual in this world. He divides people into two groups only. Only two groups. When he comes... When there is this universal renovation, there's going to be this resurrection of every human being. He is going to divide people. He is going to decide the destiny of people into two groups. One will share in the resurrection of life. Life means with God. Glory. No pain. No sorrow. No sin. Forever in the presence of the Lord, drinking of the river of his delights, satisfied in his presence, in his glory, beholding the face of God, this happy state would be the portion of one group. The second group, the Lord says, they will enter a resurrection of judgment. They will enter a resurrection of damnation. They would enter a resurrection of away from the presence of the Lord in eternal darkness, eternal punishment, eternal damnation. He, the Lord of the resurrection, would determine at the universal resurrection the destiny of each and every human being in this world. He is speaking in this portion before us. Apart from his resurrection, of two other resurrections. One happens in this world. One happens when the curtain of time is closed. History is closed when there is this 
re renovation, this renewal, this resurrection of the universe. The Lord is saying here, there is going to be a great day where there is going to be the resurrection of the universe. I will determine the destinies of each and every individual. He's speaking in verse 28 and 29 of this resurrection. Dear ones, we, are, we hear so much of prosperity gospel. We hear so much of distractions uh, in the Christian church and we miss the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. All of the Bible is about one thing. It is preparing us to stand before our maker. If we miss the main thing and go after these rabbit holes, we miss the point. The Bible's message is there is a resurrection. Where, what is your destiny in that resurrection? In fact, the Bible is full of this. If I were to take, about, take you through all the resurrection verses, we're going to be here forever. I will not take you through all the verses. I'll take a small, take a small subset. subset. God is so determined to display resurrection before us that he put it almost in every place. You cannot miss the resurrection. Man in his sin, he is blind, therefore he doesn't see it. But resurrection is in almost every place. Every place testifies to this coming universal resurrection. Let me give you from nature three illustrations. Think of the food we eat. Think of the food we eat. How did we get that food? This is how we got the food. John chapter 12, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth life, it bears much fruit. I added those, it brings forth life in between. Every rice grain we eat, God is putting the sign the witness of the resurrection. Where did that grain come from? It came from a grain that died and in its place a plant came forth and multiple raised grains came out. Let me give you one more illustration. What do the seasons testify of? The seasons testify of the resurrection. What happens in winter? Most of us have trees in the backyard. What happens in your backyard? How many green leaves are there in winter? Hardly any. It's almost, we are, most of us are thinking, this is almost dead. Is it going to die? That's what we are thinking. But what happens when, fall, when spring comes, when fall comes? This almost dead tree, as it doesn't have, it looks like it doesn't have any life. What happens? When, when spring hits, you begin to see the, these budding, this greenery coming over. And before time, it will be fully green. What is it? Luther, is, Luther said, the spring season testifies of this resurrection that is coming. Let me give you one more. What does, day, what does night and day signify? What does night and day signify? What is it pointing to? It's pointing to the resurrection. Do you want, when we sleep, how many of us are aware of what's going on around us? If all of us are thinking correctly, we would say, I have no idea what's going on around me. We're almost like dead. But what happens in the morning? Rise, there is life. Do you know in Christ? The Lord Jesus, when he talked about Lazarus, did what he said in John 11, 11. Our friend Lazarus is asleep, not dead. Sleep in the night 
day in the morning. God is speaking through every night, every day. Resurrection is coming. And man in sin can't see it. And he doesn't prepare for this resurrection. God must have a resurrection. God made this world. He made it perfect. The devil twisted everything in this world. Everywhere now is there is a curse. If God left the world in the curse, the devil wins. But by resurrecting the universe, the Lord is saying, devil, you don't have rule. I have rule. I have sovereignty. My son would bring it to its original glorious state. God must resurrect this universe because he can't let sin win. Dear ones, resurrection is testified in nature. But the scriptures, let me walk you through a few verses that God says this, you, this world would be resurrected. Turn with me to Psalm 102. Psalm 102. I'm going to read verse 25, 26. Of old, you, Lord God, founded the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. Did you observe the words? The heavens and the earth, they will perish. All of them will wear out like a garment. All of us are aware. Garments, what happen over time? They wear out and we get new garments. We put on new clothing. What, what the psalmist, the inspired writer is saying is, This world will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them. This world, this earth, this heaven, you will change them. They will be changed. They will be changed. The psalmist is seeing this world. God is going to replace it. He's going to renovate it. He's going to change it. Change it to its glorious state without sin. Listen to the words of the Lord Jesus, Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. This is the person who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. This is the one who said, I'm the reference for all truth. This is what he says. Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you will also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What the Lord is saying is there is going to be a regeneration. There is going to be a resurrection, renovation of this universe. I will sit on that glorious throne. I will be the Lord of the resurrection. He's speaking about a resurrection of, of a regeneration of the world. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Ro Romans chapter 8, verse 21. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. The current world, it is, it is in slavery to corruption, in pollution. It's under a curse. But it will be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It will be set free from the curse. It will be restored to its glorious state. Only the children of God will be in that glorious state. Dear ones, the scriptures are very, very clear. Nature's illustrations are clear. There is resurrection. The scriptures over and over and over say resurrection is coming. The question this morning is, are you ready for this resurrection?
Yes, we are singing about the risen Savior. But are you ready for the resurrection? If the Lord were to come this day, if he were to renovate the universe this day, are you ready? Are you ready to meet your maker? Which destiny will be yours? Will it be the resurrection of life or would, you be, would it be the resurrection of judgment and damnation? Which one will it be? I hope this morning none of us walks out of this room saying my resurrection will be resurrection of damnation. No, that should not be the case. The Lord of glory left his father's bosom, came into this world, lived a perfect life, humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, died like a criminal, cried on the cross, it is finished. Salvation's work is finished. I opened the new and living way. Sinners may come back to God. When he did all that, how foolish would it be for us to say, I will be damned. I will reject the son of God who did this all for me. That I may be in glory. I, a pitiful worm, full of sin. He came to save me, to take me to glory. How foolish would it be to say, I reject this savior. Dear ones, this morning, as this resurrection Sunday, let none here be part of the resurrection of damnation and judgment. Let everyone this morning in this room turn to this great God, to this great Savior. Receive life from the Savior and be part of the resurrection of life. This morning, the question I have for you is, what is your destiny? The Bible's answer if we don't do anything if we don't do anything just we are born into this world and we leave this world you will enter a resurrection of damnation a resurrection of judgment away from the glory of the lord in eternal darkness eternal pain eternal sorrow eternal fire that is what god's word says why because we all have original sin. We are given a sin nature. We received a sin nature from our first parent. Psalm 53. This, dear ones, is the condition of every human being. Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We are born with this enmity with God. We say there is no God. We say I am my own God. Turn with me to Isaiah. Chapter 47. Verse 10. This is our attitude. Isaiah 47 verse 10. This is our attitude. We feel secure in our wickedness and we say this. No one sees me. No one sees me. The last part of the verse. I am and there is none besides me. That's what we say. We take a title that belongs to God, I am, and say, I am God. I'm not accountable to anyone. We say, there is no God. We live as if there is no God, no accountability. As if uh, Psalm 53 verse 1, they are corrupt from Adam we received this corrupt nature, polluted nature. When God created Adam, the pure life of God was flowing in him, the understream, the underlife, 
He had communion with God. It was pure. It was holy. It was righteous. When our first father sinned, that underlife, that current cut off. That pure life cut off. Man transferred into the dominion of the devil. There is a polluted well there now. There is a corrupt well. All of us have this corruption in our heart. They have committed abominable injustice. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands. There is no... To see if anyone who understands who seeks after God. God is looking for one God seeker. Pure God seeker. Not idols. Not a product of our imagination. No, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. This is our condition, dear ones. Corrupt, polluted. In Adam, spirit dead. No communion with God. And if when we are born into this world, we do nothing, we die as we are, we are entering a resurrection of damnation and judgment. And the Lord God does not desire that for us. That is why his son spoke of the two resurrections when he was in this world. In John chapter 5 verses 25 to 29. The Lord God wants us to experience these two resurrections pointed out for us in John chapter 5 verse 25 and 29. 25 through 29. John chapter 5, verse 25. There is a spiritual resurrection that the Lord is talking about here. We all are dead in sin. We are, we are spirit dead. We have no desire for God. The natural mind is at enmity with God. We are spirit dead. We have no inclination, no desire for God. This is what the Lord Jesus says. An hour is coming. And that hour is now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The Son has authority to give life. He has the ability to raise those who are spiritually dead to spiritual life. In other words, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. That is what the Lord is able to do. Question this morning, dear one, is can you say from John 25, uh, John 5 25, I have experienced this spiritual resurrection. I have experienced this new birth. I have been born of the spirit from above. If you can't say that, what it means is you're still in your sins and you will enter a resurrection of damnation. That is not God's will. This is what is God's will. That today, if you are in that condition, that you would turn to him. And you would say, Lord, I don't have this spiritual resurrection experience. I want this spiritual experience, this spiritual resurrection experience. I, I cry out to you that give me this spiritual resurrection experience. This spiritual resurrection experience does not come by the will of man. John chapter 1, verse 13. This is what it says. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. If you want to have the spiritual resurrection, it won't happen. We are totally helpless. We can't create this life in us. 
just as we cannot create physical life in us, none of us went and chose our parents and said, I will be born to this and this person. No, that doesn't happen. Similarly, spiritual life is like that. We cannot create spiritual life in us. It doesn't happen by the will of man. It doesn't happen by the will of flesh. Because of your family tree, it doesn't happen. Because of your father being a Christian, it doesn't happen. Because of your blood, it doesn't happen. Dear one, this spiritual renewal, this spiritual resurrection that the Lord Jesus talks about in John 5.25 happens when he raises you from the dead. And you are conscious of the voice of God in you. You must be born again. You must have this new birth. And only God can give that. You have to ask him. He will give it. How do you know you have this new birth? How do you know you have experienced the spiritual resurrection? This is the first thing that happens to a man when he experiences this spiritual regeneration or this spiritual birth, this spiritual resurrection, the first thing he does is he sees the just demands of the law of God. He sees the law of God. He sees the character of God displayed in the law of God. Until then, the, he disregarded the law. He said, I don't care about the law. I'll do whatever I want. But now he's cognizant, he's aware of the law of God and its demands. He sees the holiness of God. You know what happens when he sees that? He begins to tremble. This arrogant man, this prideful man who had no regard for anything, this man, when he sees the law of God and its terrible judgment, he begins to shake. He begins to get on, get on the floor. He sees the wrath of God upon him and he begins to cry, God, be merciful to me. I am doomed. I am unclean. A woe is upon me. God, be merciful to me. Dear ones, there are so many this day in the church that have no idea about what I'm talking about. And if you see the lacklusterness of the church, if you see the worldliness of the church, why do you think that happens? This is the reason it happens. These people have never seen the law of God and its terrible, terrible judgments. Why are we all so callous about sin? Because we have not gone through the baptism of God's judgments. Why is it that our mind is on the world? I'll tell you the reason. Because we have not seen the judgment of God. We have gone through superficial conversions. Some idiot told us, you accept Jesus today, you're, everything is fine. And we believe that. And we are living this life of sin, not hating it, but loving it and living in it. That is the reason there is so much death in the church today. Dear one, have you gone? Have you been terrified by the judgment of God's law? If you haven't gone through it, I don't care what you say. I don't care if you are coming to church every day. You have not experienced the spiritual regeneration, resurrection. You're going through emotion. You're deceiving yourself. That is of no avail to you. The first thing that happens to a man who experiences the new birth, who comes under the new birth is this. He trembles. He sees the holiness of God. He says, woe is me for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. As he cries in the dust, this is what happens. God, be merciful to me. God, the Holy Spirit, visits him. He brings him a word of comfort. He says, look at Calvary. What happened at Calvary? The son of God, the perfect one, descended from heaven. He came to the cross. He lived the perfect life. He gave his life on the cross. He paid the ransom in full. 
go cling to him jesus paid it all go cling to him he is a merciful savior out of desperation out of this terrible anguish we go to the savior and say jesus save me or i die the holy spirit gives us assurance that our sin is on him and his righteousness is on us so our sins are paid in full now i a wretch now because of jesus righteousness i'm a child of heaven i'm a child of god i'm a child of light the holy spirit says the lord god has taken your sins and turned and thrown them into the depths of the sea your sins are forgiven go and sin no more we experience that that pain is taken away that sorrow is taken anguish is taken away now we are given this comfort go and sin no more your sins are forgiven that is the sign of new birth dear ones it doesn't matter what we profess it doesn't matter at all in the last day what matters is have you genuinely gone through the new birth experience the spiritual resurrection if you did not this morning examine yourself examine yourself there are things that happen when we experience this new birth when we experience this resurrection life let me walk you through and through some things that will happen if you have genuinely gone through that gone through the spiritual birth let me walk you through three things that happens a new nature is imparted to you when the spirit of god visits you you are born of the spirit so the spirit gives us a new nature for for a child of god a new nature is given i want to read a one verse so that it is uh, it is evident for us first john chapter 3 first john chapter 3 was was 9 no one who is born of god practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god now it's not talking about perfection here the point i want you to focus on is this we cannot continue to live in the mire of sin we we cannot have a licentious life we can't be in this life that is co- contradictory to holiness we can't be worldly the why why so because his seed abides in him god's seed seed is reflective of life every seed has what life god's life is in us therefore we cannot continue in this life of sin there is this new nature imparted to us second peter chapter 1 i'm going to read verse 4 for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you can become partakers of partakers of divine nature god's life god's nature in us when god's nature is in us there is a separation in our life we cannot be part of the world there is a separation this is what happens to us dear ones second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 second corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 but we all 
with unveiled face, which means with an open face, no blocks before us, no, no obstructions before us. We, with an open face, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are looking, we are beholding. Beholding means this consideration, this deep thinking. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. There is this mirror. Where, what is that mirror? The word of God. We are beholding God's glory in the word of God. A child of God who does not love the word of God is a contradiction. The child of God is a newborn babe craving for the pure milk of God's word. He is beholding in the word the glory of the Lord. He is seeing in the word the holiness of God. He is seeing in the word the gospel of God. He is seeing the law of God that terrifies him. On the other hand, he is experiencing this free forgiveness in Christ Jesus. There is holiness. There is fear. There is love for God. They are not contradictions. They go together. He is beholding in the mirror the glory of the Lord. As he beholds this, the glory in this mirror, it is emanating something. It is emanating something. It is emanating its glory, its light upon this man who is looking in this mirror. Moses went and spent 40 days in God's presence. What happened to him? His face glowed. He had this glory. This is what's happening, not in a, not in a literal way, but this moral transformation, this God's nature being imparted to him. Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. God's Spirit opening this word, showing the glory of God in the law of God, in the gospel of God, reflecting that glory on the soul. This soul, the darkness is going away. Light is coming. He wants to be more and more like his Lord. He wants to be more in the same image of Christ. Dear ones, if you have a new birth, if you experience the resurrection, if you experience the spiritual resurrection that the Lord talks about in John chapter 5, verse 25, this has to be a reality in our life. If it is not happening, this we are not being changed. We are not being conformed to the image of Christ. If Christ is not being formed in us, again, we are self-deceiving ourselves. It doesn't help us. Salvation does not give us a freedom to do whatever we want. I believed in the Lord. I'm child of God. Everything's over. No, it doesn't happen like that. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The child of God is very careful. The guy who is callous, what he's basically saying is he has never understood salvation. Oh, dear ones, this morning, do you have this new nature imparted to you? Are you cognizant of the power within you? When you go towards evil, there is something that says, walk ye not in it, go away from it, turn to the way of God. Do you have this conscious voice speaking to you? If you don't have that, Again, this is, you can think whatever you want. You're going through a delusion. A new life imparted, a new nature imparted. We are transformed, changed, reformed into Christ's image. We are under new management. New nature imparted. If we experience the spiritual resurrection, we have new nature. We are under new management. The child of God is indwelt by the Spirit of God. No child of God exists without the Spirit of God. In fact, it is because of the Spirit of God he received the new birth. So the child of God has this indwelling of the Spirit of God. If you can't say, I have the, I'm conscious of this indwelling Spirit of God, my, temple, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you can't say that, it is a delusion you're going through. 
you are cognizant of this new management. You are continually saying, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. I want to please the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. God gives every child of God the spirit of God to indwell. He is controlled by the spirit of God. What happens when the Holy Spirit God indwells us. I'll quickly say three things. He becomes our teacher. The Lord Jesus, when he was in this world, John chapter 8, verse 28 says this. At the end of the verse, I speak these things. I speak these things as the Father has taught me. There is a teaching component the Lord Jesus experienced because of his union with the Father. You and I, if we are children of God, if we experience the spiritual resurrection, we will go through this teaching experience. God the Holy Spirit will teach us. Turn with me to John chapter 14 verse 26. John chapter 14 verse uh, 26. But the but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Teaching component. If you're not learning, if you're not learning the things of God, that is a sure sign that you are going through a delusion. You're just going through some emotions. That is not spiritual resurrection. You must be taught by the Spirit of God. There is no Turn with me to First John chapter chapter two. First John chapter two, verse twenty-seven. 20, verse twenty-seven. The child of God is not waiting for a pastor. The child of God is communing with his father. He is being taught by the indwelling Spirit of God. First John chapter 2, verse 27. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you, but is as, as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. This, the child of God, he's given this anointing of the spirit, so he is taught. Are you, can you say in your life that I'm being taught by God? I'm, I'm being taught by God. Your Lord went through that. He's taught by the Father. Are you being taught every day? If you're not being taught, you're not under new, new management. You're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives our, becomes our guide. John chapter 16, verse 13. We're not going to go through the verses. He becomes our guide. He leads us into all truth. Truth especially pertaining to eternal things. Truth, especially pertaining to the coming resurrection. And he's telling you, the resurrection is sure. You get ready. There is a reward. Serve him as long as you have breath in you. Serve him. There is a great reward for you. He discloses to you the things to come. With each passing day, he reveals more of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus becomes more and more sweeter. He becomes the choice and precious stone. You're not callous about the Lord Jesus. You don't use his name loosely. He is choice and precious in your sight. You become like Mary of Bethany. One thing is needed. Your word, you Lord, is needed. Dear ones, if you're not, if you're controlled, if you're under new management of the Holy Spirit, this ha what happens to you? Holy Spirit, your teacher, Holy Spirit, your guide, Holy Spirit, making the Lord Jesus sweeter and sweeter with each passing day. The third thing that happens when we experience the resurrection, the spiritual resurrection, we bear fruit unto God. Romans 8.13 says, we, 
through the spirit mortify the sin. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We mortify sin. We are conscious of sin. We are mortifying. We are killing sin. Sin is what separates me, my communion with my heavenly father. I will cut it off. I'll do everything that even leads me to sin. I will cut off those channels that will lead me to sin. It could be a TV channel. It could be a song. I don't care. Whatever catalyst is there that will bring you to sin, you are cutting off, you are chopping off that thing. It could be a friend. You are conscious that you want to have communion with God. So you are cutting that thing that acts as a cast catalyst towards sin. You are mortifying sin in your body. Surely the mortification of sin is the fruit of the spirit. God's, the spirit's operation in your life. Let me say one more thing. The fruit of the spirit is evident in you. John, um, John chapter 15 verse 3 says, you will abide in Christ. You will abide in Christ. When you abide in Christ, I, this is what happens. Abide. John chapter 15, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. You are abiding in Christ, you are fruit bearing. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. There is The first three things talk about your own internal relationship to God. You have this love of God. You have this joy of God. You have the peace of God. No matter what happens in your life, you're not afraid of it. My life is in God's hands. My times are in his hands. My wise heavenly father knows what he's doing. I will trust him. I'll obey him. That's what he says. The other sixth one is your character towards the outside world. The fruit of the spirit is evident in you. If this spiritual resurrection is a real experience in your life. And it's a good test this morning, isn't it? On Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Sunday is coming every year. But the question this morning is, am I seeing the fruit of the spiritual, re spiritual resurrection in my life? Am I hearing the voice of the Son of God? Am I being taught by the Spirit? Am I seeing the fruit in my life? If that's not happening, no matter what we say, I'm a child of God. We may be going through delusion. This morning is a time of examination on this Resurrection Sunday. Let's examine ourselves. Are we hearing the voice of the Son of God? Are we living in Him? Are we abiding in Him? This morning, as I close, let me ask you, have you experienced the new birth? So far, I've spoken close to an hour. If all is Greek and Latin, if you couldn't understand anything I'm saying to you, that means you are in need of a spiritual birth. God is the one who gives you spiritual word. He says to you, if you come to him, if anyone comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will give you spiritual life. Again, I say, it cannot be done by the will of man. It cannot be done because you, you're born into a certain family. You must ask him. He, the author of life, Christ Jesus, will give you this life. You must ask him. So ask him. Dear one, if you're a child of God, if you think I have experienced the spiritual birth, I have experienced the spiritual resurrection, Are these things evident in you? Are you seeing the new nature operate in you? Are you seeing that you're under new management? Are you bearing fruit unto God? Are you seeing the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? If you do, praise God. The encouragement is, we are not perfect. The encouragement is this. Ask him for more of the work, more of the operations of the Holy Spirit on your soul. Bear fruit. If you being evil, you give good gifts to your children, how much more will my heavenly father, will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke eleven thirteen. Ask for more of the gracious operations of the Holy Spirit. Then you'll bear much fruit. And each of these fruit will assure you that you are going to partake in the resurrection of life, in the glory of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, everlasting joy, drinking of the river of his delights. Dear one, I again ask you, don't be complacent. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Ask for more of the assurance of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
Ask of more of his gracious operations in your life. Don't walk callously. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for that historical event. And it speaks to us of a greater resurrection that is coming. Oh God, we pray this morning that each one in this room would experience the spiritual resurrection, the coming back to life, having communion with the Father through the Son, experiencing the gracious operations of the Holy Spirit. Each one in this room would experience that, we pray. Oh God, let none perish here. Lord, I pray that you would work by your spirit. Let them turn from sin, turn to the author of life who gives spiritual life. Oh God, I pray none should perish in this room. Father, for those of us who have believed, we pray that we would not be complacent. We would not rest on our laurels, but we would see God is an ocean. We know nothing of him. And we would turn to you. We would behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord. We would be transformed into the same image. We would desire more of Christ in our life. Oh God, we pray that you would work in our lives. Oh God, remove our callousness, our complacency, oh God. Oh God, help us to fear you. Help us to fear you. Help us to walk in love before you. We ask you for help. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Help us all, Lord, this morning, that we would turn to you. We would truly desire to know more of you. We would truly experience the power of your resurrection in our lives that we would seek more and more to glorify the Lord Jesus, glorify the triune God in our lives. We pray that you would work in each one of our lives this morning. God, please work in our lives. Lord, we beg thee. Lord, you are our only hope. Oh God, please, Lord, work in our lives. You are our only hope, producing us the fruit of godliness. We pray these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.